I'll just hand the floor to Pranjal Sharma, who will do a fantastic job and he will introduce himself. Thank you, Joel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And Joel, as you can see, my background includes the French flags colors. The I didn't dare mentioning. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here uh, uh, for this afternoon on the on a topic which is absolutely critical. I think uh, we have been talking about economic refugees for a long time, but I think one of the key issues that we need to address is also ecological uh, refugees, and that's something that we are seeing as well in recent years. And I think one of the most important ways to to address that is through issues of uh, uh, managing climate change. The subject and the theme of the uh, seminar and workshop today is the interlinkages and sustainable fisheries and enhanced livelihoods. And therefore, the, the linkages and the connectivities are so stark that sometimes we, we don't realize that, you know, below the uh, surface, as it were, these linkages are very strong, not always visible, and sometimes policy making the and the industrial and business ecosystem also tends to neglect it. But uh, fisheries, uh, food security, job access, all of these are very, very uh, important for, for us to understand. So any policy making has to consider all these elements as, as we move forward and not just at, the, at a national level, it has to be at a regional level, at a global level and in a collaborative way. I'll quickly introduce our speakers for, for this afternoon. Uh, and uh, then I will request them uh, to present their uh, thoughts and presentations in the order of the uh, program mentioned. Uh, we will have Ms. Afifat Khan Amritika, Research Officer, Institute of Maritime Research and Development, BIMRAD. Ms. Runa Khan, Founder and Executive Director of Friendship NGO. Uh, Mohammed Abdul Wahab, World Fish Eco Fish Team Leader, Bangladesh Wing. Uh, Dr. Farrows, uh, Dean of the Fisheries and Marine Science Faculty, Ocean University of Sri Lanka. Uh, and there will be a presentation by uh, Mr. Mahbubul Haq, Additional Director General, Department of Fisheries, and uh, Dr. Sharifuddin, uh, Director Marine, Marine Fisheries Office, Department and Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, Department of Fisheries. So clearly very, very highly uh, uh, specialized domain experts who will be addressing us uh, today. I'd like to uh, begin by inviting uh, Ms. Ritika to begin her presentation. Uh, I'm Afifat Khanam Ritika. I'm the research officer of BIMRAT. So as a uh, speaker from the panel too, I'm going to describe uh, or going to present my presentation on interlinkage in sustainable fisheries and enhanced livelihood action and fisheries for food security, job access, and climate change adaptation in the region. So my uh, presentation is containing some uh, topics that means very shortly about marine environment, coastal community, then COP26, credibility gap, and what is the actually future of our climate change, then why Bangladesh is highly climate vulnerable, then regional impact of climate change, what is the actually interlinkage among climate change, marine fisheries, and livelihood. And finally, I have um, I have uh, explained about sustainable fisheries management in connecting with livelihood and climate change, and what is actually BIMRAD do, and finally my conclusion. So here is the marine environment. As we know that after the peaceful demarcation of maritime boundary, the area of Bangladesh is now 1.18813 square kilometer, and actually it is extended up to 200 nautical mile for EEZ. And within this EEZ, Bangladesh has mainly four fish grounds. That grounds that means the uh, South Pachis, South of South Pachis, Middle Ground, and Swatch of North Ground. So if I describe the present status of marine fisheries, our uh, Moshe Ramasar has already been described all the aspects, but I'm going to uh, mention that at this moment, Bangladesh marine fish production is about 0.67 million metric ton, where the estimated possible catch from the Bay of Bengal is 8 million metric ton. That means there is a huge gap and way to develop. So this is the biodiversity in the uh, Bay of Bengal. At, at this moment, there are more, uh, total seven, 740 fin fish species, but at the present condition of Bangladesh, the fishermen are mainly uh, able to catch only 32 to 33 species. So there is also a huge option for uh, diversifying the fish catch and diversifying the uh, fisheries activities. 
So if I describe the coastal community, that means the total we have 19 districts in the uh, coastal area that covers almost 32% of the total landmass, and the population is about 28% of the total uh, population of our country. And livelihood for the coastal community is mainly fishing, agriculture, shrimp farming, salt farming, and mostly tourism. And we also know that the Shundarbon supports almost 10 million people in the coastal area with their uh, food collection activities, honey collection activities, and fisheries also. Now, uh, the most important thing is where is the COP26 credibility gap and where, what is uh, the future of the climate change? So here uh, I'm showing a, uh, showing a diagram that means that if we fulfill all the aspects that are related to the, our announced targets, including net zero targets, the all long-term targets, then fulfilling all the requirements after uh, by, two, uh, by 21 century, the total climate change, change the total global warming will be uh, for three degrees Celsius from the pre-industrial average uh, time. And if we continue the present status, the uh, climate change or the temperature increase by 21st century will be almost 3.9 degrees Celsius. So it means that if we fulfill all the aspects, we are still in the risk of climate change. Uh, not only for Bangladesh, it is the global, uh, global concern at this moment. So proper strategy should be taken to uh, adopt climate change, to control our livelihood, to, con uh, to control our coastal community as well. So why Bangladesh is highly vulnerable, here, here is a pictorial form that Bangladesh is highly vulnerable because of its geographical uh, location. As we know that it is a active delta region and its flat low lying delta exposed topography make it, makes it more vulnerable to climate change. And this is because uh, the most climate change uh, vulnerable uh, scenario is the sea level rise in the coastal community of Bangladesh. So if we uh, continue, what is actually the reason, regional impact of climate change? The most important one I have already mentioned that the sea level rise. And from the data, we can see that if this condition continued by 21st century, 0 0.5 to 1.5 meter sea level rise will be occurred. And one meter of sea level rise will keep people risk in about 15 million. And with 1.5 meter salinity inclusion or sea level rise will keep more than 18 million people under risk. So if we see the impact on food security, it represents that by 2050, if the present condition continued, if uh, by 2050, eight to 17% of rice production would be lost from Bangladesh coastal area. Agricultural GDP will decline between 27 to 57% uh, by 2050. And uh, salinity increase rate will be 0.74% per year up to 2050. And the expected, uh, it is expected that if the condition continued, 50 centimeter sea level rise uh, by 2050 will keep more than 6% of the coastal agricultural land in, uh, under threat due to climate change. So here I've shown the interlinkage among climate change, marine fisheries and livelihood. As we know that global warming, it is responsible for climate change. And when climate change occurs, it changes the ocean chemistry. As we know that ocean has its uh, standard quality for parameters of different water quality parameters like oxygen, uh, salinity, temperature, acidification or pH, alkalinity, everything has a standard amount or standard uh, measurement. But if this climate change occurs, the whole chemistry will be destroyed or will be altered or will be changed. As a result, the uh, community or, fish, uh, or marine community, marine biodiversity that lives on that area will be highly vulnerable or either they will migrate or they will be lost. When the whole production of biodiversity will be lost, ultimately the loss of livelihood is the uh, final consequence. And uh, it is the same for the coastal region, coastal environment. The, Freshwater, uh, freshwater sources will be declined, different types of cyclones will be occurred frequently, and as a result, the whole, whole coastal community will be under threat. Now, as a fisheries, um, as if uh, from the fisheries aspect, what should do for Bangladesh to have uh, to adopt livelihood under this climate change vulnerabilities? And I have going to mention some points on this on that aspect. First of all, in the context of Bangladesh, we should expansion of fishing horizon and should stop overfishing. 
we know that from this picture uh, for Bangladesh, we are able to catch only up to 80 meter day and only for 170 kilometer distance. But it is still possible to catch up to 500 meter, 500 kilometer distance and 200 meter length, 200 meter depth. So if we see that only uh, 80 meter uh, depth and 170 kilometer distance are still are till now available for the fishermen to catch. This huge area is totally untouched or unexploited. So it, this this is me, this means that Bangladesh is still in the limited uh, limited area for fishing. If we can expand extend the fishing horizon, if we can extend the fishing area and fishing uh, capacity, then ultimately the livelihood will be secured and ultimately the production will be increased and the food security will be uh, will be controlled. And uh, during this climate change, a uh, climate change aspect. And the second one is the stock assessment to develop management strategy. We know that uh, in Bangladesh, uh, before 1980s or 1970s, some stock assessment was, were done, but, the, uh, but after a protected pause since 1999, the Marine Fisheries Research Survey within the Bay of Bengal uh, has started only in 2016 with RV Shandhani. And we got already a report uh, from Min Shandhani on stock assessment that is not complete and we are waiting for the final report. And but, uh, we definitely keep in mind that it should, be, should not be confined within this report. Proper stress, a proper management strategy should be developed on that on that aspect to avoid climate change and to protect the biodiversity. Because when there will be a full report on stock assessment, we will be able to know about uh, which ground or which area is for which species. And as a result, uh, the fishermen will be benefited. They will go for target fishing, and the uh, strategy management strategy will be possible so that. Uh, we can we'll be able to know that from the stock what amount are present and what amount should be caught for the sustainability. May, then the deep sea fishing practice should be uh, should be uh, in, should be keep in mind for Bangladesh. Bangladesh is still not able for deep sea fishing, where from China, India, US, they all are doing deep sea fishing very frequently. So. If we go for deep sea fishing, it will open a new opportunity. And for, during this climate change aspect, it will create new hope for Bangladesh to get more production and even to get more sustainability of livelihood. And already Bangladesh government has taken a pilot project for the extraction of tuna, uh, tuna and deep sea fishes, but, um, uh, but still there is a lack of training and, uh, and uh, technological capacity develop uh, capacity lacking. So we should go for deep sea fishing and we should come forward uh, to with those countries that are going to practice deep sea fishing for getting proper knowledge and for developing the fishing practices in our own country. Now the now this is about the banning of destructive fishing method and fishing gear to avoid biodiversity and secure livelihood. We know that only collection of one single shrimp peel destroy almost 37 peel of other species, 11 pin fishes, LRV, 31 macro zooplankton. So only one shrimp collection from the nature is very destructive for the other uh, different species. So it is a very uh, harmful effect or harmful method to um, collect shrimp from the nature. So these types of activity should be avoided. And even in our in our country, trawlers are mostly operated in shallow water. As a result, the whole biodiversity and habitat they destroy. So these types of activities should be banned from the uh, marine environment and we have to protect it for sustainable fisheries. Now the MSP planning is very important uh, because for a good governance of the uh, marine environment, MSP, is, MSP plays a very important role when we go uh, for MSP, it will protect the livelihood through securing uh, multiple options for the resource collection in the coastal co uh, community and also for Bangladesh whole economy. Now the we can go for salt tolerance, freshwater fish culture, and mariculture practice also. As we know that some fishes are salt tolerant, like fungus, like tilapia, some eel fishes. So we can go for uh, salt tolerant, uh, freshwater salt tolerant fish culture in the coastal area, integrated with the crops that are also salt tolerant. And we can go for mariculture practice as well. 
nowadays the seaweed culture practice uh, practices are going to popular going popular in bangladesh but we have to go for other species as well so that we we have to not depend on nature only for uh, only for marine species the isle fishing and piracy is the most important one in 2019 bangladesh coast guard arrested 500 indian fishers and they seized 32 boats from the from the ez of bangladesh so this is very alarming when even it occurred in the 65 band period on marine fisheries in bangladesh so this is very alarming this is very harmful for the biodiversity and also harmful for the fishermen of the local or regional level on the other side, there are total 51 incidents of uh, piracy have been identified in 2020. That is almost double than 2090. So this is also alarming. This is also very vulnerable. This is also keep vulnerable uh, our, our coastal community. And considering the climate change, this is also an, another threat for sustainable fisheries management. The MPA declaration is also important. We know that according to SDZ 14.5, uh, by 2020, there should be 10% of the coastal community under reserve or preserve condition, uh, counting the total area of, uh, of a country. But at this moment, Bangladesh has only 4.7%. But there are some areas that are high, that are highly hot spots for many fisheries. So we can go for further actions for the proper, uh, proper management. Now I'm going to describe about the BIMRAD action plan. Actually, what is BIMRAD and what is BIMRAD going, uh, BIMRAD is now doing uh, on this marine field. So BIMRAD is actually a Navy patronized organization. So from the uh, from the very beginning, BIMRAD is very much aware of the, um, and very much aware of the marine environment and doing research on the marine environment, marine population all over the marine aspects. So uh, at this moment, the going uh, ongoing research is the traditional and non-traditional threats in the area of ocean. BIMRAD is doing research on that. BIMRAD is uh, developing uh, developing and guideline and strategy for the local level uh, local level uh, fishers sea going fishers so that they can reduce the climate induced loss and damage bimrad is doing uh, identifying the critical factors for uh, that are responsible for the stagnancy on many fisheries and also bimrad is doing on rohingya issue so future plan bimrad is uh, uh, bimrad is very much um, interested to have collaboration to do joint research uh, and they are planning to do research jointly on some aspects because we know that as a navy patronized organization bimrad has the ability to go or explore the ocean and they have the instruments as well to collect sample so considering all the aspects bimrad is planning to do some research on dead zone as we know the dead zone about dead zone it is a very alarming issue at this moment in the bay of bengal and possible way out bimrad is planning to for sustainable eco friendly maritime tourism strategy development as we know that during the log, uh, lockdown or covid 19 period uh, the indiscriminate jumping of dolphins in the uh, sea area or in the cox bazar region that has never been seen in last 30 years that create a new hope to the expert's mind. So considering the situation that times tourism were to totally closed due to the COVID-19 period, and considering that situation, BIMRAD is planning how ecosystem could be back to, by proper management strategy. BIMRAD is uh, thinking about coral restoration, and they are thinking about uh, the gap identification of IU fishing, and even recommendations from the Navy aspect of Bangladesh. And they are planning to identify the need-based livelihood because when we transfer fund, we fund, uh, fund it without uh, assessing the, their need, without assessing their uh, amount of money, how much they need actually. So these types of profile we not want to create. We are planning for stock assessment and how they can, uh, the feasibility test so that the um, St. Martin can be declared as MPA so that the St. Martin, as we know, it is a hotspot for many biodiversity. So they are planning how we can protect St. Martin and its pollution. The final one is BIMRAD is always our of creating awareness among the among the communities so that they can uh, take part to protect the marine resources. At uh, considering this situation, regular seminar, webinar, workshop activities are going on jointly and from singly within the region or with uh, with the other international organizations. So here is the conclusion. This is a picture that indicates that it, it is mainly a well picture that found in this year in the Cox's Bazaar or in the uh, coastal area. 
for CBT area. So that means uh, expert scholars believe that maybe this is, this is because of the uh, pollution or this is because of the climate change. So I uh, would like to mention here that when there are these types of situations are occurring, if we do proper management strategy, we can get the production in a sustainable way in this climate change uh, challenges. And when the production is increased, that means there is a smile in the fishermen community and the fishermen or that increase the total production and economy of the country. So sustainable management and sustainable production increment, increment for the next generation is very important at, in this climate change vulnerability condition. So that's all from my slides. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Radhika. That was uh, very, very important. I think sustainable fisheries is, is critical. Uh, I think, thankfully, we are not learning the bad habits of the West of uh, overfishing and using mechanized trawlers, which have resulted in a serious depletion of marine resources. And I think Asia and South Asia uh, have to develop our own standards to ensure that while we improve the livelihoods and improve the productivity, we also make sure that there is enough for regeneration. Thank you so much. I'd now like to invite uh, Runa Khan for her presentation. Runa, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Panjal. So I don't have a presentation slide. I have a little video which I'll show in a little while. Uh, however, I uh, to introduce myself, uh, for, so 20 years I've been working in the front line of climate change. Uh, I've been where I started my work in the chores of the Brahmaputra and the Ganges, del, you know, uh, the, the river islands, the shifting river islands there. And I don't have to describe Bangladesh to you. Most of you know that it's uh, it has already been mentioned very well by Mr. Rahman and then uh, by our other panelists. It's a land of really of a thousand rivers. And the rivers, for those of you who don't understand, just look at the city of Paris. The city of Paris can fit into the river, the river on the width of the river Brahmaputra. So that is the width. And with sometimes rivers flowing at 10 to 12 knots. I, it's formed of silts, islands are being broken and made. And it is the same in the coastal belt. So our ecosystem of the geography or the nature of the islands are quite different from many other regions formed by the silt of the Himalayas. So here I've been working for 20 years and we are a kind of a, a social purpose organization with four promises of saving lives, climate action, because that is the thread which runs through all our work, poverty elevation and empowerment, which enables us to work directly with the communities for the communities over 20 years now. 100% of our work has been with the climate migrants, the internally displaced persons. And today, more than 7 million people are directly accessing our services every year. So it is not an impact, it is the service delivery which we are giving for 7 million. We are working more or less all the areas in Bangladesh where there is water and there is migration internal migration happen. No empowerment can happen if there is no poverty alleviation. And it is with this, a big component of working on these islands are working with the fishermen, the agricultural communities, and ensuring livelihoods for them. 70% of the fishermen that we have got are subsistence fishermen. And this is about 17 million people who are working in this area, out of which 1.4 million are women you know, some way or the other linked to fishing and the fishing industries. And uh, it the, 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 the belts, not only of, the, of the, the Bay of Bengal, but the distributaries of the rivers, I would count it as one because it is not so different because it is a delta plain and, the, and, and which falls onto the coastal egg, onto the coastal plains. So the marine and the, and the contact of the hum, human communities are linked with the marine communities right from where the Brahmaputra is entering into, the, into Bangladesh or the Ganges or the Meghna enters into Bangladesh 
right onto the coastal area. This is why I take it as a whole. Difficulties are not the same in the coastal belt and in the in the chores of the of, of either for the fishermen or for the communities who are trying to make a livelihood. So in 2007, when I went, I started working in the coastal belt. The the most amazing thing for me was that these fishermen communities couldn't find fish. They really did not could not find fish. And this happened not only was it for the fishing seasons, but even out of season. And they were kept in a hostile environment of being caught by the middlemen. Now, I am not saying middlemen are bad. That is a kind of a, <laughs> advocacy which people does. I am not doing that. Middlemen also provide a lot of good to the fishing communities. It's not that they are all bad. But they are held in a kind of a system by which they cannot get out of. For example, grandchildren are repaying the loans of the grandfather. And these are hundreds and thousands of communities. We started working with about, 40, we, have, we have today about 41,000 fishermen, fishermen and communities that we are working with in the coastal belt. And we, need, we needed to find a system which would take them out so that they would have independence of working and therefore livelihood. So what did we do? Very interesting things came out, you know. One was, for example, as I said, they were totally caught. They couldn't get out. You were allowed to repay the loans in a season where you couldn't catch fish. So, of course, they couldn't get out of the loans. And these were little things. They would ha have to go to the, to the fishing areas, you know, to the sea, spend their oil, gas, Come back without fish, but every day they had to go out, be it storm or rain. And we were that, then we decided that we would change the modality of the way that these communities worked. We actually, you know, I wanted to just show you to bring you that we are trying to work with the ecosystems, the marine systems. But if people, but we are really working with the IDPs and the communities around these areas. And we are, after all, facing this climate crisis, speaking about this climate crisis, all this, it is for the people and the environment, of course, and for life on this planet. So life is very important to sustain, and I wanted to bring a picture of those life in front of your eyes. You know, who are the victims? Who are the ones who are, for whom? All our uh, global pictures and global statistics should be accountable to. This is why I needed to bring this platform here and their voices to you. So we started, of course, as I said, that the poor need everything and you need a platform on which to start. And it is how we started working with the communities. And we have about 41,000 farmer communities impacted now. Uh, who, uh, not farmer communities, farmers, uh, fishermen who are now today part of our system. So what we did we do? We first took them out of, you know, we provided what we called a liberation loan. So they could repay back the middlemen and then we gave them capital financing so that they could uh, have, the bo have a boat and they could have their nets repaired, etc. And then an operational loan. So some of it, of course, was quite different modality from the microfinance modalities which, are, which were in existence in that area. And with that today, we find that a change has come within the fishermen community. Because after all, it is these, these artisanal fishermen, I would say, they are not the ones who are harming the fish and the life and the ecosystem. It is these big trawler boats which are there for companies which are causing the harm. So I go into a micro level and I reinforce that it is not these fishermen who with their one net trying to catch some fish, even if it is off season, vis-a-vis -vis the big trawler boats, which I hope people will take into account, which are coming into our waters all the time, even from the country and out of the country. Secondly, there is, this is not enough. Alternative livelihoods need to be given to them, which means from sal saline crops to ensuring 
that people can cultivate land and have some kind of an income when they cannot go out into the into the sea during the times when there is uh, the fishing season is not there so we shouldn't just say stop fishing we need to ensure that they have an alternative life and mangroves we are speaking continuously afd is doing so much work you know for protection and you know uh, ensuring that infrastructure is being built here do we do have very simple infrastructure of a but very needed infrastructure of uh, of the mangroves which protect our em em embankments how much do we do to protect these how much are we doing to protect these infrastructures we need mangroves and friendship started the uh, we are the biggest private sector mangrove reforestation project in bangladesh today and it it is we work with the communities this is not a country which is like the amazon basin or other countries where you don't have a population we are a country one fourth the size of france with double the population with 52% under water most of the time the density of population and the needs and scramble for land is immense and this is the reason why even in when we are doing reforestation or the blue mangrove as we call it it is extremely important to work with the community now whilst in doing this what now, we need to understand the impact of the mangrove this has been spoken of course today we have understood the importance of mangrove but importance of mangrove to that one individual for whom it's life and death how does that happen so mangrove re reduces when the waves come in 66% of the wavelength are reduced it can take out 4 to 8 times more carbon from the atmosphere why are we not investing more into this the embankment erosions you know we spend so much money with the embankment and repairs this prevents water purification of, is done there is a storage of carbon of course of about 8.1.08 uh, million you know kgs per hectare and we are ignoring that we are not doing enough for that millions of marine life can grow in this 75% you know of the tropical fish which is available in our areas are all linked to the mangroves and this is why the afforestation of the mangroves is compulsory we need to do this for the protection of lives and livelihood and thus we launched our blue mangrove fund where individuals you know from all over the world can uh, can come in and they can pay for 1 hectare for their carbon compensations for afd i would really deeply recommend that they step back and look a little bit into their bilateral scopes of funding because it's extremely important to work with the government it's also extremely important to identify identify projects which are directly going to the people and work with the government for those projects a solar village for example afd is working with electricity but what about these hundreds and hundreds of chord when you put up a pole and it's in the water the next day you need solar villages we created the first solar village in these islands which can be removed and whole communities have developed from market to an ecosystem of financial uh, 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 platform from which they can quite easily take off so even in these islands electricity is very important but you cannot always have the main grid so we need to look into this a bit more deeply and loans for development when you when when organizations like afd are giving loans for development development is not only financial returns that we get it's those millions of people who are getting a returns in terms of having that platform from which they can take off economically so perhaps to rethink a bit on the strategy of the loans would be a request and uh, of course ourselves we are very happy we are we have got an organization in france we can work with them but the ecosystem of the blue ecosystem cannot just come in one day because along the bay of bengal the blue ecosystem is so connected to the human ecosystem and we cannot just work on the blue without working on the human ecosystem. 
and uh, I would like to bring that to the platform. I hope BIMSTEC would also look at that and AFD would also look at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, again, very inspirational work, which you've been doing for decades and working at the, at the ground, um, at the edge of the people who are living for just subsistence is, is uh, not easy, one can imagine, but uh, this has to be done. I, I like the point you made about IDPs because, you know, if you look at IDP, uh, people outside the country think about it as a national problem, but IDPs can become a global problem as well. And therefore, it's absolutely a critical that, uh, you know, the world collaborates to ensure that we have minimum uh, IDP. And the second point I'd like to highlight from what you said is about livelihood uh, transition. Uh, there is no doubt that in South Asia, uh, not just in Bangladesh, I would say that uh, we have to we have to skill people for transition transiting to new ways of earning a livelihood. Not jobs necessarily, but earning a livelihood, which improve which includes skilling, uh, yes, perhaps uh, marine based uh, uh, processing units, perhaps agri based processing units, where you do a lot of value addition. So I think if if those can be done in a structured way at a rapid scale, uh, I think it'll be critical. Thank you so much for your uh, uh, also for your idea and suggestion to AFD, I'm sure the AFD team would be very grateful for, for those ideas and, and collaborate with you uh, further. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'll now move on to our next speaker and also request everybody to please stick to your time so that, you know, we can all uh, end, uh, end in time and keep to the discipline so that we have a more uh, interesting evening for the rest of the day. Uh, after all, it's Friday evening. Dr. Firoz, please begin. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your invitation, uh, uh, Dr. Poet and uh, Dr. Sharma and the uh, organizers. So I would like to give a small uh, introduction about our institute. Uh, I'm from the Faculty of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, Ocean University of Sri Lanka. So we are uh, primarily worker on uh, training producing manpower for fisheries and ocean sciences and allied fields. Once I got this uh, title, actually, uh, I thought what I would speak. So because it's more social relevant, however, there will be no social uh, uh, because uh, this fisheries is more related to science and uh, the nature. So I just wanted to change the the latter part uh, uh, called marine ecosystem based management. So it involves human food security, uh, livelihood, poverty elevation, whatever. So just uh, wanted to come back to the ocean ecosystems and why fisheries is important. So I classify that food. So we get the food or the biomass comes out of the ocean. And instead of food or fisheries, there are a lot of other uh, ecosystem services undervalued at the moment, but enormous. So fisheries, the fisheries, if you think, what is sustainable, a sustainable fisheries? Sustainable fishing is involved, like we have to save something to ocean, not take everything. But nowadays, the situations become worse because we need to conserve and we need to manage, protect from the people, the oceans and its biodiversity. So for the future. So that is addressing the management need and how we should do fishing. There is no problem that we can use oceans for sustainability or sustainable or subsistent level fisheries for local communities or artisanal type. But if we go into commercial scale using uh, the wild capturing, it becomes a lot of problem. So these are some of my observations. Just to make you think, I would believe that pictures can talk thousand words than this explanation. So, so Elasmo Grant Fisheries is one 
So what is we need to highlight here? We need a uh, good management, uh, fisheries related management. What the effective management requires? We need to clearly have the definition or the goals related to it with a multidisciplinary approach, integrating several factors, right? So the effective management, uh, I, I was uh, talking about the clear definitions and goals. And uh, then we have to come to the uh, user groups. It's of course, this is human involvement, the human face. So the user groups, we have to get uh, very much strategic and strategies and use practical tools. It's not tools, but practical tools to implement and enforce. So this uh, practice and uh, tools, once they apply, they need to exchange with the information, feedbacks, and its loops to allow assessment of its success and failure. So that is where we uh, remain to the literature or uh, passing the experiences. So this is the, the core of uh, management uh, to rescue uh, or the better sustainability of the fisheries industry. So there are a lot of uh, environmental changes we call uh, one aspect of global warming. It's because of this uh, incidence, marine ecosystems are changing. So there are a lot of other responses, biophysical feedbacks as uh, natural uh, interactions. And also human activities are triggering, coupling with that directly to deteriorate or deterioration of uh, 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 degradation uh, of this system. So that is actually depleting the resources what we have. So therefore, we have to think about uh, ecosystem-based management for oceans. The goal is to maintain the ecosystem in a very healthy and a productive, resili resilient, and uh, its, its condition. And it, this will provide continuously uh, services, goods and services to the mankind. So in that aspect, we have to have these key interactions identified and the dynamics and complex factors affecting to ecosystems in a large scale or long uh, long term or shorter scale shorter uh, scales for example in the we call the micro or macro scales and also uh, identify the disturbances so this is uh, very much important for example that we had this catastrophic events such as tsunamis that we had affected, we talk about the Bay of Bengal, this region were suffered from the tsunami. So that is a very much dangerous impact. So the ecosystem saved many parts, but where the degradation occurred had impacted. This is what we have evidence. It adversely affected the human lives, the society economic loss. So therefore, the nature will come back. So therefore, we have to have the understanding. So the theme of this discussion is related mostly with the fisheries. So just wanted to focus on the health and the climate change and the fisheries, and the livelihood, food security, all that aspect. I think the resource is the most important place where we uh, focus on natural systems. So nowadays, this uh, fishing is becoming a catastrophic level uh, in the, because of the overfishing. There are a lot of uh, big fishers 
or apex predators are being removed due to the usage of unsustainable gears, different destructive practices, very much commercial level, not the poor fishermen. That is what I am suggesting. Just to think about, to go to the scale, what scale we have to focus. There are identification about this phenomena we call as a food, uh, um, lower, the lower trophic levels are dominating because they're fishing down the food web. This is one of the processes that we call. So the, the effects of bottom trawling, for example, in the commercial level, that cause severe damage to the sea floor, such as coral reefs, seagrass beds, changing the biogeochemistry and the geological structure, chemicals, composition, sedimentation levels. This all matters to create the different, different ecological processes, such as top-down, bottom-up processes. These are very much in general. What I would like to highlight in here, just to focus on the sustainability, how the sustainability would come. So we have to minimize the pressure onto the national, natural habitats. So one of the aspects, since I am a marine biologist working on coral reefs for many years, just wanted to show you one thing that now the coral reefs are turning the other side to say that these reefs are algae reefs, that because the algae, micro algae is taking the space which is available to reefs. So the coral cover is declining over the years. These are, these are the results of a global report uh, published recently. So the uh, degradation is higher than the recovery because of this fishing and other activities taking part in the coastal and in the open ocean in the higher level. So that is one of the facts that I want to highlight. Th think about moving to different alternative to get the food security focused and create more sustainability, allow the natural uh, system to uh, recover or maintain as it is, giving them minimum pressure as much as possible. So one example that I wanted to highlight throughout my research. So we have studied uh, healthy systems, particularly coral reefs, where the coral reefs are overfished the situation become very much worse because of this overfishing situation can remove the herbivorous population, let the algae grow faster than corals. And corals were also switched to degrade because of opportunistic diseases due to the bacteria or microbial activity due to different uh, compositional chemical changes in the water chemistry. And the eutrophication, various runoffs can also create such situations. So that all synergistically, or we call uh, 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 combine multiple stress stresses, that level, they were impacted uh, to to represent the present situation. So that is why I'm highlighting here just to maintain the fisheries, at least to go this component as the natural way with some sound management. So the current status and the oceans require much attention to come up with the solution based on ecosystem approach to hold uh, greatest promise to delivering desired results. So it is very timely. So I would say one approach, for example, that uh, for the Bay of Bengal region, for the first time in Sri Lanka, for the Asian region, we have worked on introducing the mariculture. 
this is one of the avenue i am just telling as an example just to uh, turn the strategic community engagement this fisher folk as an example to focus on more culture and to add the value chain and uh, uh, to strategically on uh, turn the business in a different dimension so this is one of the thinking that we are in practice now so just think about it and uh, with that i would like to conclude uh, uh, this session and uh, i think i summarize the aspect uh, the sustainable fisheries and how it relate to the livelihood uh, climate change and uh, alternative livelihood and poverty elevation whatever thank you very much for your attention thank you sir i think that was uh, important for us to know uh, i think the focus on coral reefs is very critical and i i noticed that you have a wonderful colorful background of coral reefs as well so i think uh, you are uh, really walking the talk on that one uh, dr ferros um, i think what's very important is uh, to see what has been done for regeneration of the reefs um, and i think that's something which we would have to share technology and efforts and new processes uh, which are being looked at across the world and see how we can adopt them in our part of the world thank you so much and now i'd like to invite uh, mr abdul wahab uh, for his presentation may i again request everybody to please stick to the time so that we can end within the allotted uh, uh, time that we have thank you thank you very much Okay then, uh, its topic is sustainable fisheries and enhanced livelihood lessons learned from one project that has been jointly implemented by Department of Fisheries and World Fish. Uh, World Fish uh, is the CGR organization. It has got mission to reduce the poverty and hunger through fisheries and aquaculture, and uh, its choice of delivering fisheries and aquaculture solution in developing countries. Marine fisheries in Bangladesh, the resources are uh, is quite good, if not enormous. We have the total marine area, one hundred eighteen thousand square kilometer, and our economy zone is two hundred, and we have got coastline of seven one zero. This is the major species as mentioned. But important thing I like to draw your attention: the sixty thousand boats, in fact, harvest the eighty percent. Four percent of the fish from the Bay of Bengal, and having a big dollars, we only get sixteen percent. And the marine fish um, only contribute fifteen percent to the total production of Bangladesh. And our Secretary of Fisheries, Joint Secretary, as well as um, our colleague Ritika, gave um, comprehensive overview. So some areas may be repeated. I would beg your pardon. Uh, we have. analyze the relative importance of major marine fishes and this is the scenario that the hilsha shad constitute 45% of the total fisheries and other is a pelagic small fish also dominating in the catch but the other important fishes are not that much dominant however government has taken measures to improve the stock by putting a uh, 65 days ban period as well as hilsha ban period brood hilsha ban period as well as juvenile ban period blue economy it's a must told thing it's a dream project of bangladesh bangladesh government as the people of bangladesh has dreaming of blue economy there are 26 sectors have been identified by bangladesh government however our interest is on fisheries artisanal and industrial aquaculture fish processing these are the areas mainly this is our beloved uh, bangladesh's uh, the economic areas where after a uh, peaceful settlement with our neighbor in myanmar this is the bangladesh territory where bangladesh can fish out but bangladesh fish is only about 100 km not more than that here i i will just go straight to our project that uh, we had a wasted funded project that is for hilsha shad and uh, i will tell you a story of how hilsha shad uh, revive hilsha is a migrating species is adult to spend in the ocean and it comes to the river for breeding 
economically most important. About 7 million people lives on Hilsa, fishing, livelihoods, as well as 1% contribution to GDP. So the efforts of Bangladesh government, particularly DOP, Wildfish, BFRI, now Hilsa cash, 86% of the total cash. And we have moved forward. We now dream to have 600,000 um, uh, Hilsa a year. Uh, we are yet to analyze this year's data, we'll know more. However, there are unregulated and overfishing in the marine environment. We have done five years of study, so they are summarized in one slide. We set up the maximum sustainable yield, we can reach up to that level, and we have effective fishing ban period for 22 days, no fishing during that period, fish comes to the uh, river for bidding. And on the Meghna, there are three tub species as well. We have changed the um, uh, gill net fishing from 4.6.5 that helps uh, in uh, releasing the young ones. And doing that, we have done social well being uh, for enhanced economic resilience. We provided to about 28,000 households in 150 villages. We supplied the cows, goats, provided the seeds, machines, and we provide the capacity building training of about 17,000 people. And we provide livelihood support to nearly 29,000 households. And that is the way. And also we have taken gender transformation impacts aspect that the Fisher's Women are group, they started uh, collecting the money and saving scheme and they take the lessons so that they um, can calculate the income as well as maintain the bank account and they can read and that helps them to uh, become confident in leadership and communities now accept the women's in different management committees as well and women's mobility increase that encourages their income opportunities. Also through this project, with the help of Department of Fisheries and other government agencies, we made a stakeholder engagement, several posters, several processions, women involvement to stop brood hilsha or jatka fishing. That has helped. And that ecofish contributed with DOP to the hilsha fisheries. We, Bangladesh government, and we introduced the fish sanctuaries, imposed fishing bans, enforcement enhanced, compensation given, and co-management implemented by World Fish and DOP, that has changed the national fish hill shakas from 190,000 tons to 550,000 tons. That's a matter of in 20 years, but we worked for five years. And now Hilsha contributes 12% of the total production, and apart from five, Million, uh, 0.5 million fishing communities, 250 other people, a uh, million people also involved in Hilsha, Halusain. Still, resilience of the fishers' livelihood is a great concern. So that is the scenario. And that was the beginning. And two things, that the Hilsha size has increased. So when size increased and abundance increased, that is the indicator of uh, sustainability of the Hilsha production. We started from here, we reached up to that level. So from business as usual, we gave a high production of 9.2% per year. Ecofish faced challenges though. It was not a um, very smooth journey. Fishing communities are extremely poor and vulnerable to climate change. Fishers do not own fishing gears, boats rely heavily on loan sharks, have been heavily exploited by the money lenders, Dr. Runa Khan mentioned as well. Fishers sacrifice for biodiversity conservation, but benefits go to the boats and gear owners. No organized bodies there to raise their voice or establish their rights, I believe, through our upcoming projects, DOP will lead to establish a federation through which fishers will be having their own voice. Industrial tollers often mop around the 40 meters depth zone of the ocean, which is earmarked for the artisanal fishers. IU fishing is 
come on as uh, our um, um, Rita, uh, Ritika uh, mentioned that one, uh, how much um, uh, it takes place in Bay of Bengal. We have taken care of the IUO started though. So we assessed the IU status by the artisanal fishes and trained boat skippers Mazi for responsible fishing and biodiversity conservation. We are providing them life jacket and also the medical kit to get saved during the crisis. We have introduced community fish guard. They are taking care of the uh, illegal fishing and juvenile fishing along the uh, ocean. And this is huge, it's only one landing station. We, um, as I think um, our um, chair mentioned regarding the use of the uh, fishes for developing the uh, products. So pelagic fishes, which are otherwise used for livestock feed and often thrown out, we have encouraged the fishers to bring that along and give it to the women who are purchasing it and giving it to the women. And they are now drying it, making fish powder. And even during the 65 fishing ban period, crisis period, they have been given to those people as well so that they can um, feed their family. So fish powder produced, hygienic sieve dried fish, it can provide nutrition income and we are upscaling it. So far, thousand fishermen, women are engaged in this dry fish and fish powder processing. As part of blue economy, that's the part of blue economy I mentioned and that part of blue economy I mentioned in BE, seaweeds farming has been introduced in Bangladesh. And over the last two years, several technologies we have tried, but now the best one is the man sitting there that is floating method that has given very good um, production this year. This year's slide is not there, it's an older slide. However, this is in the Cox's Bazaar where the refuses are taking place, one million refuses in that region, it is being cultured and successfully cultured, but constrained what to do. Majority people do not eat, do not use. So we need diversified product production from these, yeah. So in France, I believe there is a Biomar company who are producing different elements. I think our breast tank can um, think of utilizing our um, seaweed, huge seaweed production for productive purposes, export or domestic market. We have also, in the student life, we studied green, uh, blue mussel in New Zealand. And this is green mussel available in Bay of Bengal. We have success, we have been successful in producing it. It is again pilot scale. We will multiply it in the coming days. And I would like to bring one. There was a climate change issues we had discussed. One slide only I said that around one of the island, an engineer, an environment engineer made this structure and allowed the oyster to settle in. The oyster is harvested for family food, and this gives excellent embankment and saved from the um, uh, climate effect, particularly waves and tide, and saves the um, uh, coastal land as well as the uh, forest. So it protects coastal land and erosion, save the climate vulnerable household, provide nutritious food, and human shelter. It also enhances biodiversity. Blue economic priorities in Bangladesh aspects. I'm going very fast because of time. I may uh, not um, finish, that's why. So there are two ways fisheries intervention and climate resilient marine farm. So fisheries intervention, our secretary already mentioned that stock assessment has been, uh, been going on. Uh, we emphasized that 30 major fish species to set up maximum sustainable yield. Adopt EFM. Our friend from Sri Lankan University mentioned EFM. We encourage to introduce it to artisanal fisheries to ensure fish harvest at MSY level. We need to develop market linkages to enhance exports of marine fish and other blue fruits. I believe AFD and Bridge Tank can make a breeze in this 
areas. We need to develop, we need to organize artisanal fishers stakeholders under National Fisheries Forum, National Artisanal Fisheries Forum to secure rights uh, to their resources. We should support, improve the resilience of the coastal fishing households. We need to provide support them and so that they can um, bear the shocks and stresses, particularly during the cyclones and the natural calamities, as well as 65 days ban period, which is very bad for them. And also we need transboundary efforts with Sri Lanka, India, as well as Myanmar, to stop and control IU fishing, as well as there is a complain that there is mid sea transhipment of the fish harvested that should be stopped. We cannot stop alone. We need transboundary negotiation and efforts together. Regarding the climate resilient marine farming, our suggestion community laid community laid fishers from fishing, they are now culturing the seaweed and we need diversification of the products. Farming of palas, green mussel, oyster, pearl farming, bivalve snails, Farming of him fish, our secretary also mentioned, sea bass, sea pomfret, silver pomfret, grouper, mullet, in cases and coastal ponds. We need to, we have, uh, um, uh, we have kept 200,000 hectares of coastal lands for sheep and crab farming, but the production is not that mass. We need to introduce improved methodology and also sustainable so that that can help Bangladesh back in its economy, nutrition, and employment generation. Last slide. In the Blue Economy Action Research, I was a professor of university, always think for research. So I believe we need to introduce some research in the program, research in development or research for development. That is environmental and climate change impacts, ocean acidification, and changes in biotic composition assessed. Biological productivity and fisheries, we need to do the stock assessment of major fish and shrimp made. It is in the process. We need to speed up, scale up, and improve the system. We need to uh, improve our facility as well. Our Minshandan is doing well, but we need better vessel and better trained personnel as well. Regarding the artisanal fishes, fishers' well-being and resilience should be considered. Fishers safety at sea provide GPS so that where they are fishing, do not go to the other country's water bodies, as well as life insurance. In every year, some dozens of fishers die of cyclones and unnoticed um, um, calamities. We need life insurance for them, and security from pirates also should be ensured, and research should be needed. And we need to ensure just wages and fair share for increased cash, health cash increased double, but the increase of uh, share as well as the benefit remains the same. And good governance, still we have not yet included APO code of responsible fishing and SSAT small scale fishes guidelines that should be adopted. I believe Department of Fisheries will take care of it. We'll continue to request them and convince them and make aware of that and 40 meter depth, ER marked water for artisanal fishers must not be mopped by the large dollars. I believe the government will take care, international community will also oversee that is maintained for the benefit of the artisanal fishers. Last of all, technology is yet to develop properly on seaweeds, mollus, crab, marine feed fish, and shrimp farming developed in the long run. So that's my presentation. I'm very sorry for the interruption. And I'm very grateful to Joel Rich, Mallory, and also to the chair and others for assisting me in coming to that position. USA, this is a USA funded ecofish activity implemented jointly by the Department of Fisheries and World Fish. Very grateful to um, Breeze Tank kindly allowing me to give this presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh... I think the main takeaway was uh, the examples you shared of uh, two points. One, uh, of course, was uh, uh, about the processing and the value addition, and we were referring to that in the previous uh, speaker's uh, session as well. 
I think that's absolutely critical to create livelihoods. And secondly, I think the main issue is about training. The way you talked about training of the uh, people who are driving the boats and navigating the boats and te teaching them where to fish and how to fish, I think it's very, very critical. So thank you for that. You may remove your presentation and I'll request the uh, next uh, set of speakers, uh, which will, after that, we will end our session. Mr. Huck and Dr. Sharifuddin, uh, may I request you to uh, start your presentation, please? Yes, uh, good evening from Bangladesh. And uh, I think uh, good afternoon and uh, good uh, morning uh, might be from other places. Uh, uh, yeah, and welcome to my presentation. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thanks uh, the uh, Bridge Authority for uh, giving yes. Uh, yeah, give me the just uh, chance uh, to uh, meet with this uh, very valuable group. Uh, just uh, from my side, I think I would like to share about the Bangladesh experience uh, that uh, what we are uh, uh, going uh, and what we are doing about the initiatives from fisheries sector uh, in the for the blue economy. Yeah, see, yeah, in Bangladesh, uh, you know that we know that Bangladesh is a uh, uh, just. Uh, fish eating nation and a lot of that means uh, 6 billion annually uh, with the fishery sector contributing to our national economy and our role uh, of uh, uh, we have further uh, yeah, just uh, access to this uh, growth of this uh, sector but what is the problem is that the majority that means more than 80 percent of the total marine production is coming from the artisanal sector and this is uh, a, a, Bit unmanaged uh, for MCS uh, uh, from MCS system, and uh, a lot of people. That means more than uh, 1.5 million people directly involved in this artisanal fishery sector uh, in Bangladesh. And uh, within this uh, workforce, uh, more than 1.38 million people uh, are uh, female who are uh, just. Uh, involved uh, with for fish processing and bit with uh, fish uh, marketing uh, system. See, uh, our fisheries sector contributed uh, to our GDP more than 4.4%. And for agricultural GDP, it's more than 22%. Nowadays, as I uh, just uh, told that, uh, Bangladeshis are fish eating nation and uh, annually we are taking uh, more the, uh, about 19 kilogram per uh, fish, and uh, uh, this is contributing about 60% uh, of our uh, animal protein intake. And however, I, I would like to say that uh, small indigenous fishes from both inland and from marine origin or coastal origin is uh, a very good source of protein, minerals, and vitamins that in Bangladesh we love it we like it and we take it. And it's also a very uh, good uh, source of vitamin A that uh, we always consume. And uh, after introducing this system, uh, uh, that the side blindness and uh, night blindness is just coming down. Uh, see, in my, uh, what I said earlier that 85% of our, uh, Fisheries, the marine fisheries case is coming from the industry, uh, uh, artisanal sector. Uh, it is very problematic for us uh, to manage the sector. And uh, as per the Marine Fisheries Act, nowadays we have uh, we have uh, differentiated these uh, fishing fleets into three parts. One is industrial fisheries, that is only the tallest that we have, and we have mechanized boats in the second part, and artisanal fisheries, that means. Uh, less than 15 metric ton uh, net ton is, uh, of the mechanized boat we are just uh, defining is at uh, artisanal fisheries sector. See, now the status of artisanal fisheries sector, if you go for this sector, we can see that uh, all these people are there living in the coastal uh, area and they are fishing uh, from the generation to generation and they are using uh, their knowledge uh, that th th those uh, they are uh, just uh, gaining from their fathers and uh, it's uh, they are uh, in inheritably they are getting it 
and socioeconomically they are mostly disadvantaged uh, group and most vulnerable uh, yeah, people uh, in the um, coastal areas. Uh, even in the uh, most uh, vulnerable uh, people uh, in the coastal uh, for the climate uh, uh, sense. Okay. These artisanal fishermen uh, just they are fishing for subsistence and cast from uh, highest uh, they are uh, just uh, going uh, for fishing up to 40 meter depth and uh, they are using traditional knowledge and is cast is small and is also adult fishes. And uh, from our of uh, from earlier uh, speaker, we learned that they are uh, sometimes they are not uh, bothering for uh, size or laws. Just uh, they go to fish in the, um, the sea or coastal area, and they fish, and they come back. They don't uh, never look after the laws and regulation and uh, and such type of things. See. But the problem is that what we are facing to manage these fisheries is that the fisheries sector and fisheries resources in Bangladesh is multi-gear and multi-species in nature. To manage such type of multi-gear, multi-species fisheries is difficult. It's not like a single uh, fisheries uh, in other developed uh, countries. Uh, it's very difficult to manage because in one year we can call, uh, we can uh, harvest different types of fishes and different uh, types of uh, uh, year uh, harvest single uh, fishes. It's, uh, to manage this, it is very difficult. Uh, what I have seen from my uh, practical point of view and uh, many of my friends, uh, I think, uh, do, uh, uh, yeah, do agree with this system, with this uh, knowledge. See. This fisheries sector, uh, from uh, many of our earlier uh, speakers uh, told about the vulnerability of the uh, climate change uh, on the fisheries, yes, it's very uh, critical for us, sea level, if sea level raise, then uh, reduction of freshwater availability by salinity, it will be a great problem for us. And uh, then it will create cyclone uh, frequency, water salinity. If uh, comes uh, now, it is in zero to twenty ppm. It uh, goes uh, up than twenty. Then it will create problem, and it will just uh, the, uh, degrade our total ecosystem. Fish water, uh, uh, fish production will be come down. And Sundarbon, you know that uh, it's uh, mangrove first, and it uh, if one meter sea level, then our Sundarbon will be disappeared. And uh, if uh, sea surface temperature increases, then uh, some of our valuable fishes will migrate uh, to the other place. See, uh, for the development of this fisheries sector, uh, government of Bangladesh uh, initiated uh, different, uh, many of the development projects in different times. Now, in at present, uh, almost we have four development projects uh, to develop in the marine sector. One is Sustainable Coastal and Marine Fisheries Project. It is a mega project, Hilsha Development and uh, Management Project. Uh, we know that Hilsha is our national fish, and uh, we have a, a very good and a very uh, creative and very uh, remarkable achievement with this uh, fish. And uh, we are also uh, just executing uh, some pilot project, uh, one pilot project on tuna and similar pelagic fish to, uh, in deep sea. To, uh, and uh, just uh, one, uh, my earlier uh, presenter, Dr. Ruha, already told about enhanced coastal fishes uh, project in Bangladesh. Uh, we learned uh, many things about this project uh, from his presentation. Uh, it's our uh, sustainable coastal and marine fishes project, a mega project uh, from Department of Fisheries under Minister of Fisheries and Livestock. Uh, and uh, uh, the target of this pro uh, project uh, to achieve the blue economic uh, sector. And all these uh, objectives are targeted to the values and job of, uh, creation and livelihood system. And it's a mega project. I told it that, uh, and the project objective is to uh, the to explore greater economic opportunity from coastal and marine fisheries uh, resources while promoting sustainable management of fisheries stocks and environment to reduce uh, poverty and improve livelihoods of the coastal community. Uh, with this project, uh, we have learned from our uh, Joint Secretary, Mashur Rahman, that uh, in here we have uh, four components 
and uh, uh, one component for fisheries investment and growth, uh, second uh, infrastructure, third community empowerment, and fourth for project man management. I think one, two, three is directly related to our uh, present subject matter, that means valuation, job creation, and livelihood uh, matter. Yes, uh, this slide, I, we have learned from this slide from uh, my, uh, yeah, mm, the, our joint secretary presentation. Uh, and uh, ILSA development and uh, management project uh, is uh, just, uh, I think, uh, one year we have started this project. And this uh, project is also uh, just targeting to develop uh, and uh, the sustaining our uh, ILSA production uh, in the coming days. And this is for implementation of fisheries raw laws and uh, instrument of ILSA sanctuaries. Uh, uh, we have success stories about the Hilsha conservation and production of Hilsha brood and juvenile by law in, uh, implementation and AIG support uh, for livelihood and job creation and distribution of uh, uh, distribution of legal fishing nets to the fishermen. Uh, these are the objectives of, for the project. And uh, we have a pilot project uh, on Pune and similar pelagic uh, fishing in uh, deep sea. Uh, in fact, uh, from my earlier uh, presenters, uh, uh, Ms. Ritika told that uh, all of our fishing efforts are confined within, uh, I think, uh, 80 or uh, 100 meter depth zone. But uh, we need to uh, send our fishing fleet and fishing effort to the beyond our, that is the deeper portion of our uh, EZ and beyond uh, our EZ area, uh, new area beyond national jurisdiction and uh, from our side, we have tried to uh, just, uh, just uh, we have tried to uh, have or some people or uh, some uh, in, in investors uh, for this sector, but uh, they didn't uh, show uh, show any interest uh, for that reason. Uh, Bangladesh uh, government initiated this project from uh, government side, and Department of Fisheries uh, just executing this uh, project. Uh, to make as a, as a pilot scale. And uh, enhanced coastal fisheries in Bangladesh, EcoFish BD, uh, from my earlier uh, presenter, uh, uh, we have uh, learned a lot about this project. Uh, uh, intermediate results, uh, they have four. And with this project, uh, I think uh, as far as I know, 136 villages uh, they work, and uh, with uh, uh, 20,000 households, uh, uh, already engaged uh, for that uh, the, uh, activities and livelihood for management, uh, all these things are, are targeted uh, for that. Uh, and uh, yes, so all these things are from EcoFish BD. Uh, but we have some challenges uh, already that is, uh, we need exact uh, stock assessment. And uh, from our uh, research vessel and land based survey already, we have started this and uh, started it and uh, illegal. Uh, unreported and unregulated fishing is also a concern uh, like other uh, our uh, South Asian countries. Uh, it's a problem because uh, uh, in that artisanal sector, all of them are uh, just out of our uh, the controlling system. Only few uh, are with our controlling system and uh, they are using the, uh, destructive fishing gears and casting juveniles. Uh, coastal pollution is a problem because from my uh, the practical experience, uh, what I have seen that uh, when uh, just uh, after trawling, uh, trawl has come to the deck, uh, almost 50%, sometimes more than 50% are, are uh, the plastic substances. Uh, that means microplastic pollution is a great concern. Uh, in our Bay of Bengal, uh, the, just uh, like other part of uh, the world, uh, we need to uh, address it and degradation of, uh, degradation of coastal and near shore uh, marine habitats is also a concern for us. Adoption of medical, sir, we need it. And MCS, MCS and MCS, I, I always uh, just uh, stick with the MCS because MCS is the only tools to manage the marine fisheries sector. And climate says adoption, pollution, uh, uh, environmental degradation is also a challenge and issue for us. However, uh, for way forward, uh, I think uh, we need to formulation in implementation of national uh, marine fisheries policy. We have adopted it, and uh, now it's under uh, approval stage. 
and we need to assess uh, uh, stock assessment that uh, we need it uh, rapidly and restrict and control posting is the problem national problem for us uh, and collaboration collaborative before uh, for standing mcs with coast guard navy uh, we have uh, river and police but we need to strengthen more and uh, promote medical sir including seaweed culture I explored the potential uh, of this deep sea fishing and also MSP required. See, uh, from my experience, what I have seen in this session, I would like to say that only the fisheries sector, only from the fisheries sector, we are sitting uh, together. But blue economy no, is not confined with the fisheries sector, I think. And uh, many actors are uh, uh, working uh, for the blue economy and uh, from my view, I think uh, it's required. All actors need to be come together. Uh, see, uh, some of my uh, early presenters uh, told that cooperation, collaboration, and knowledge sharing is required. Uh, I will uh, just conclude my uh, uh, presentation with one example. Uh, what we are facing, uh, what uh, time of troubles we are facing that we have a big, very good success with 65 days ban period for marine uh, fisheries uh, conservation. And India also imposing such type of ban, but we are uh, neighboring countries, but uh, we are not uh, uh, doing this uh, practice in the same time. So we need knowledge sharing, collaboration and cooperation. And see, we have very good success with 22, uh, two days uh, fishing ban on uh, brood hilsha, but India is not uh, doing this. Uh, see, but hilsha is also uh, joint, uh, that means uh, joint sharing stock, uh, it, it is also migrating uh, from uh, the, uh, India EZ and Bangladesh EZ and uh, Myanmar EZ. So uh, it is also required to uh, do the conservation and development work uh, from both the, the countries simultaneously. From my side, it's uh, very, uh, uh, I, I, I would like to say, as we are sitting together, we need to do all the things in a cooperative, collaborative and knowledge sharing basis. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I think you summarized it very well in terms of collaboration and cooperation. And I think you also used an, another phrase, which is a policing, because of uh, which many speakers have referred to, you know, if, if uh, mechanized trawlers are coming to uh, Bay of Bengal and our area, I think uh, we have to make sure that uh, uh, such kind of encroachment is not allowed at all. But I think uh, with this, I'd like to thank all of you for your presentation. Uh, we have gone through a lot of deep issues uh, through your experience and your uh, expertise. I hope that uh, this will lead to a very studied and a very important uh, way ahead, which Bridge Tank and AFD can take forward. Thank you so much. I'll hand it over back to Dr. Ruet. Thank you, Pranjal. Let me again recall everyone that uh, Pranjal uh, is a noted uh, economist, uh, Commentator he has had a long experience with uh, Bloomberg, with uh, Business World in, in India, and uh, with the World Economic Forum. And we are very grateful and honored that, uh, not content with being one of our very key board member at the Bridge Tank, where you're actively participating to. Uh, to these workshops that shows the interest that uh, those uh, topical and uh, um, technical subjects have today, uh, as we've understood that broad solutions have to go through the nitty gritties of uh, technology, of human systems, eco ecosystems and, and integration. Uh, we've had, and I thank all the participants throughout the two sessions and the audience, which has been numerous and patient. Uh, uh, we've heard many proposals, many suggestions. Uh, as I said, it's the first of a series, it's the beginning of a process. We've taken minute and careful notes on these suggestions. We work on them, we revert back to everyone. And uh, so will the AFD, I'm sure. Uh, Jackie Ampro from the AFD, I don't know if you want to have a final word. Um, 
uh, or if I've, I've spoken in the name uh, of the AFD uh, correctly, you. But the final word is uh, is to, is to you, I think, Jackie. Yes, thank you, Joel. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the the, the panelists. I don't want to 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 add too much, but uh, yes, we, we this first webinar of a series of three already gave us a lot to think about, and um, uh, we also have taken great uh, careful note. Uh, all the suggestions are, are are well taken. Again, the purpose of, of that discussion with with experts of the sector in the, 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 the Bay of Bengal is really to help us to think of uh, how we can develop our activity in that sector, which is really new for us in, in, uh, in uh, South Asia. We, we have a lot of experience in Southeast Asia, but not so much in, in, in South Asia. And uh, all the recommendations, suggestions uh, are very useful for us to feed our discussion with the government, because uh, as you know, we, we work mainly with the government because we are a bank and we need a borrower, obviously. And uh, usually the, the government is a borrower, even though we do sometimes non-sovereign loan, but uh, it's, uh, hello, I'm, am I still connected? Yes, yes. Ah, sorry. Oh. Yeah, I uh, thought I was disconnected. Sorry. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's very useful for us to, to, to have our policy dialogue with the government. And uh, we also um, expect a lot from the two other webinars, which will be very much complementary to, to what we have discussed today. And thank you again to, to all the panelists. Thank you to you, Joel, for, for, for the organization, to all the team, and to, and to Pranjal also for, for moderating the second session. And we look forward to, uh, to uh, participating to uh, the second uh, webinar, which I understand will be scheduled in January and the third in February. I mean, you might want to reconfirm this schedule or timeline. You said, you said it all. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you.